Okay, our next speaker is Rick Stoll. He's going to talk about development of a livestock siting assessment matrix. All right, thank you, Rhonda. Um, I'm one of the uh, members of the program committee, and, and uh, I was one of the people who suggested that this session be put on, when, on Friday. And, uh, and so I don't know if I was being nice, putting me as the last presentation, like nice to other presenters that they could go before me since I'm the last presentation of the conference, or if I'm just that big of a procrastinator. So um, we'll, we'll see, but I, I hope not to hold you back too much from, from going where you're going. Uh, the reason for presenting this is uh, there are probably uh, people in the audience here who had next uh, several years will get an opportunity, whether you ask for it or not, to participate in some type of process like this uh, at the state policy level. And um, there's really no information out there if you go and, and look beyond what, what the tool is that they, they developed. You don't get any background information or, or process information. So that's my goal here is to, uh, to help others out. In Nebraska, uh, so we have a matrix now in Nebraska. Iowa kind of no, is known for having the first livestock siting matrix. Uh, and Nebraska's wanted to copy Iowa in that regard for many years. And uh, Wisconsin developed their own matrix uh, several years ago. And so there's been a lot of momentum uh, towards this. And uh, the matrix tools that are out there are very different, including ours. but um, the idea is, is usually the same. So in background, I'll give you a little background of why uh, Nebraska is looking for this. I'm going to go through a very quick tour of the tool itself. Um, we could spend all day, the rest of the day, um, going through the details, so we're not going to do that. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about uh, perspective on the development process. What was the process like? What was the committee thinking about? Those types of things. And um, then we'll have some summary comments. So in terms of background, uh, Nebraska, at least the perception was that we were not a friendly state in terms of uh, we were a difficult state. We were not a friendly state when it came to expanding operations or having uh, new operations developed in the, in the state. Um, a lot of that was because, um, or the perception was, that it's due to us being a local control state. So a local control state is a, a state where counties have the, are able to have their own uh, regulations, their own requirements, uh, in addition to anything at the state level. And uh, so, so one of the things you will probably see in most local control states, uh, and these are a combination of reality and perception, but there, there will be a wide range of uh, actual requirements from county to county. In Nebraska, there are probably um, nine or ten kind of standardized. Uh, you can this this county looks like this county over here, um, but each one is different. There, there's hardly any that are, that are exactly the same. So that makes challenges for someone who's trying to locate in the state. Uh, they have to deal with all these different counties and different requirements. There's also, uh, we've never gone and I've never tried to document this, but I hear all the time that within counties, there's also inconsistent or variability in terms of how those requirements are applied. So a generic example of that is if they have a specific requirement and they have uh, 10 proposed operations come in that all meet that requirement, well, nine of them will fly right through because they met that requirement. and the tenth one that comes in, they meet the requirement, but oh, you have to do this, something extra. Or you don't meet it for some reason that's not really defined. So that usually ends up in a lawsuit. The, uh, the applicant uh, oftentimes will sue the county because um, they were treated uh, differently than what was specified. And uh, so that, you know, nobody likes lawsuits. And then, uh, is presented by Tang. Um, you saw that room full of people. Uh, we, 
our local, uh, depending on the size and, and the county requirements, most of the counties require a public hearing and that can turn into chaos. Even if everything was in place and by the books up until that point, uh, depending on the s specific scenario, that can turn into chaos and, um, and again, create a lot of in inconsistent uh, treatment of the process. So uh, the state was looking for a uh, state level policy and it was proposed by a uh, legislator in Nebraska as a requirement. So the, the goal was that it be a, a mandatory thing where the, if you met the, the state policies, the state requirements, um, the county would not have uh, jurisdiction. jurisdiction. So that, um, that was before May 2015. Uh, what was actually passed uh, by the governor of May 2015 was uh, the background for the matrix, putting together a committee. In October 2015, the committee was put together. Uh, June of 16, uh, we had developed the matrix for review. Uh, the end of that year, it was uh, finalized and uh, ready for, for use in January of 2017. And now after two years of re use, uh, the committee got back together this last fall, reviewed it, made some changes, and uh, it's now again um, ready for use. A little bit about the committee that was in there. Uh, nine members plus some uh, ad hoc people from Nebraska Department of Agricult Agriculture. Uh, four of those people were uh, industry folks, two producers, two consultants. Uh, four of them represented county officials. Uh, two of them were primarily zoning administrators. And uh, two of them were uh, elected officials, county supervisors, county commissioners. And then they wanted, they needed a university person, and um, Amy and I duked it out, and and um, and I basically was was brought on. I lost, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, we can go into that later. But um, I, they wanted someone on the committee with experience with the odor footprint tool, and I, I had the longest experience with the odor footprint tool. Bottom line is uh, I was one of nine, and uh, everybody on the committee was, uh, I would say, uh, support, definitely supportive of responsible growth of agriculture, animal agriculture. So that's the context in which this was made. There were no anti-animal uh, agriculture people on the committee. Um, I'm going to go through uh, parts of this, so if you want to follow along or for future reference, uh, here's the website. It's on the Department of Agriculture's Ag Promotion uh, webpage. So that should give you some context about what the background of this tool is. It's supporting ag promotion. Uh, or you can search uh, on Google, put in Nebraska Livestock Matrix, and it'll come up very high. The other thing you might want to keep in, hot in mind as we go through this is the passing score is 75 points. So just keep that in your mind as we go through. So I'm going to go through uh, an example pretty quickly and, uh, and come back to some of these things uh, for some further discussion. So just so I had in some numbers in the tool, I'm going to do a 2,000 head uh, swine finishing facility, a deep pit facility, pretty standard type of, uh, not cookie cutter, but nearly cookie cutter uh, type of facility in, in Nebraska. And uh, so they collect, you enter, an applicant would enter some information about the operation. There are no points. And uh, a question we get a lot is, is uh, do large farms uh, get deductions and small farms get credits? And, and there's no points based on size. Um, environmental protection uh, plans, I've got in there, there are actually two titles to this, this section. Uh, and I'll come back to that and talk about that a little bit. Um, but basically this has to do with permits, uh, state permits and what's included in the state permit. And we'll come back to that. But the points available in this section is 30. So 30 out of the 75 points needed to pass is are you going to have a, an approved state permit or uh, something from the state say saying you don't need one. Um, 
uh, to get the 30 points that, towards your passing score. Next section is on sighting relative to neighbors. And uh, I'm going to come back to the, these two first sections. But uh, so you enter the distance, separation distance between the nearest neighbor and then the county setback. And if you meet that setback, you get 30 more points. Yes? Does prevailing wind direction have any impact on distance of neighbors? So I'm glad you asked. I'll get to that later. And so the short answer is no. OK? So I, but I will come back to that. Uh, next section is environmental compliance record. So if you're a good actor and you have some, you've been a, in production for at least five years, no, no tr uh, track record that, uh, of non-compliance, uh, you get five points. So. Uh, water quality protection in terms of the facilities. So these are some additional things, kind of reinforce um, positive things in the, in the, from the community's perspective about facilities. So a deep pit uh, finishing barn, for example, is going to have the animals under roof, the uh, manures under roof, so there's no runoff being contaminated, plus the uh, manure stored in a concrete facility. And so those three aspects get additional points. And we could argue all afternoon about whether people should be getting points for this stuff, but the reality is there are some points assigned for, for some of these, and some of them, if they check them, they don't get any points. Uh, odor and dust control. So these, we've already addressed a permit, right? And we've already addressed the setbacks. So these are kind of additional things. And so all the things you see up here are, should, should be looked at as non-conventional. Additional things, yes? So is export only an option for the permit application? Export only for manure? Yes, in Nebraska, you can still export manure. And, uh, and we'll come back to that, because that relates to nutrient management plan. OK? Um, but in this case, so I, I forgot to explain. Uh, when I picked a 2,000 head finishing barn and filled this out, um, I picked a scenario where you have kind of industry norms or conventional practices. I'm going down through here and checking uh, a producer, an applicant, who is going to do the vast majority of things that we already think they should be doing, uh, but nothing above and beyond that. Okay. So in this case, none of these are checked yes. Biofilter, digester, all those things, none of those things are you're not doing anything that uh, most of the industries are not already doing. Uh, next section has to do with manure application. And there's two main sections of this. There's how is the manure applied? And then what is the crop conditions, <coughs> conservation tillage, uh, cover crops, those kind of things. So, as you look down through here, it's uh, injected, manure is injected, um, and what's other? And they have cover crops. So that'd be two things. So maybe cover crops wouldn't be conventional, but this would be a, a high end uh, industry normal situation. Manure application separation. So this is looking at distance to waterways, distance to wells, uh, vegetated buffers. Uh, I think Amy presented that. One of the slides talked about um, uh, graphic infographic on uh, manure application separation and buffers. And so you can get or lose points um, in these sections based on that. Additional assurance of environmental protection. So these are things that, so I say I lined the, the earth and storage. Do I have evidence to support that? Well, the person at, at NDEQ probably has that, but this is just saying that they have to prove that they actually lined, acceptably lined, to get that extra uh, point or two uh, toward this. Uh, traffic, uh, if we, at the county level, the f three things we mainly hear about, water quality, air quality, and then traffic. So one section here is specifically about uh, traffic, and what you're seeing is a scaled down version. Probably 60% of the original ideas were weeded out. 
And, um, and so what you're seeing is what's left. <clears throat> a little bit about uh, authorized uh, representative. So if there's a flood and, and the owner or the manager lives, uh, can't get to the operation, uh, they don't get any points, but if somebody's nearby, they do. Neighbor communication. If you're talking to your prospective neighbors, you get a lot of points. Economics was written in. We had to have an economic point value here. A lot of people didn't like that. But if you're adding jobs, income, potential property taxes, you get points. Aesthetics, another contentious area, but we know it makes a difference, so that was included. And in this case, passing score. If this person was not, uh, didn't, didn't have their permit in place, uh, or ducks in a row there, uh, so they easily passed here. And I think we would agree that this person, applicant, probably should pass easily. Uh, if they didn't have uh, the points for the setback, uh, they would not have passed. Okay. And they'd have to then argue about is it easier to, to find a new location or to do whatever we needed to get enough points to pass. So I'm going to raise some things, uh, the key issues. You don't see science or obje objectivity up here. So that's a key. And the four main things I got from this process are simplicity, has to be simple, and I mean really simple. Transparency, but what I mean by that is you can have a black box, but when they come in, they need to know the answer to the black box. They can't just be told that they have to enter some things and then find out later what the answer is. They want, both sides want to know everything up front. If there's a number involved, they want to know what the number is up front. Questions of merit, uh, if people are already doing most of these things, uh, there shouldn't be points of, allowed. If we're not sure about uh, whether this is a good idea, it was probably thrown out. Okay? And then will to retain control. So I'm just going to um, pivotal lessons learned. Uh, whether something is mandatory or voluntary makes a huge difference. So just think about that. If people have to attend your training workshop, versus if they're, they can attend and get CEU credits, your program's probably going to look different. The same's true here. Uh, so this went from mandatory, was the idea, and it went voluntary, things totally changed. One of the things that changed is the counties made it very clear they were not going to adopt this tool if the setback wasn't a main uh, point getter. And so things like the older footprint tool, wind direction, it's all in there. So this is part of the tool, but it, it's, it's voluntary. So basically we're setting a template and hoping that the county sets their setbacks based on these types of tools. But they don't have to. And uh, environmental compliance versus uh, protection. So basically the idea here is um, we had a bunch of poultry operations come in and they don't have to have a nutrient management plan. And that, that created a big hole in our situation because now we looked at it and said, and it's still this way, um, how important is a nutrient management plan and should be worth any points. So I'm going to actually stop there. That, that's one of the main things I wanted to do. And uh, take some questions and see. Yes? On your background cats, uh, Ohio, basically cats everywhere you have livestock. Do you do the same thing? Do you look at others? If a person applies for a permitted facility, do you look at what they've done in other states? Yeah, the county generally does that. Um, and that's something I didn't know. But they generally look. They can't find everything, but they do look. Any other questions? All right, thank you.